Good evening. All right, saints, we are going to continue our series on ethnicity, race, and the Bible. And I'm really excited to talk about this because one of the things that I hope you realize as we consider what we have in Scripture and just look around our world today, these concepts of race and ethnicity are, in my humble opinion, constructs constructs that are created for a particular purpose in a culture and society and ch change as the needs of that society or culture change. So that one of the examples, I was looking over the slides that Pastor Wesley did with you all, the concept of the one drop rule. Um, one drop of black blood historically in our country made you black. Um, in what scientific equation would that make sense? It's a construct that supports the needs of a given culture and society. That's not just true for us today. So what we want to think about is when in the Bible we see distinctions between people, how and why does that happen? Okay? So tonight we are going to continue this study by looking at the Bible, which is what I like to do. Um, and we're going to look at the table of nations the table of nations is the genealogy that we find in Genesis chapter 10. And I understand that you all had as a homework assignment reading chapters 10 and 11, yes? The people who did it are nodding yes. Everybody else is looking like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's okay. If you didn't read it, we'll take a look at it together tonight. Um, but Genesis 10, 1 through 32 is known as the table of nations. And then under that second bullet point, you see that tiny print, um, that is um, uh, a notation. Walter Brueggemann has a Genesis commentary in the interpretation series that I like a lot. And he talks about the table of nations as a verbal map of the world. So that at that time, at the time that this text comes to its final form, this table of nations reflects the people's understanding of the makeup of the world. And I say at the time when the text came into its final form, because I need you to understand that there was not someone running around with a tablet recording everything as it happened. You know, and so-and-so beget, oh, let me write that down. Um, that's not how it works, right? We have these oral traditions that are held and kept over time, but when they come into their final form, the story is not only telling you what happened, but it's also sharing with you the worldview of the people who are telling the story, all right? So that our current situation creates a lens through which we talk about anything. Yes, yes. So that's a part of what we wanna think about when we look at this table of nations. And it is one of the two genealogies that we have at the end of the primeval or primordial history. So I'm just gonna do a little quick review. I know you all are at Alfred Street and you know everything, but for the one person who may not know, the primeval history is the term we give for the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And this term primeval means from the very beginning or origins. And the idea here is that what you have in the first 11 chapters of Genesis is different from the rest of the material. And I put historical in parentheses because it seems to me that we want to understand the material in all of Genesis as the story of Israel's relationship with God. The testimony is probably a better term than history. And the reason I say that is because we have a concept of history um, that is flawed even in its modern sense, all right? That we think that history is some objective account of what happened, and I would say there is no such thing as an objective account of what happens. And so every history we give is given from a certain perspective, and it's told for a reason. It's the same thing in the Bible. It's given from a certain perspective and told for a reason. And so if we want to understand the history, we want to ask ourselves, who's telling it when and why? All right, those are the questions we want to ask about the Bible, and the answer is not just for me. All right, so that the stories that are being told are for that community and then for us as inheritors of that tradition. Okay, so 
The first 11 chapters in Genesis are about the origins of the universe. And for that reason, it is universal in nature. And I would push that a little further and say it's timeless in scope. Because the first 11 chapters in Genesis want to explain not just how things came to be, but how things are. So that if you look at the story of um, Adam and Eve in the garden, it's not just telling the story about how the first two people were in relationship with each other. It's telling us something about how we are in relationship with each other, right? That moment when God comes to Adam and says, what have you done? And he says, the woman you gave me, that's not just Adam, right? <laughs> that's us, right? So the story is telling us how things were, how things are. And that's the timeless element in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So every time we read something, we want to ask ourselves, how is this story telling us something about who we are? Okay. Um, so... We have genealogies, and how many people in this room enjoy genealogies? Okay, those of you who raised your hands, I need a few to tell me why. Why do you like them? Go ahead. Helps you understand your family. Helps me to feel a connection to the past. Puts things in context. Fills in the holes, <laughs> absolutely. It does all of those things. All right, well, um, when I was growing up, genealogies were not my favorite thing. Um, and, you know, it was all in the King James, beget, 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 begat, begat, begat. And, you know, all these awful names, and we had to go through. And um, what I want us to think about when we look at genealogies is that all of those things that were said are true. It reminds you of your story, it fills in the gaps, it gives you context, and it really does help you understand if you know where the people came from, all right? Sometimes you learn something about somebody or where they came from, and you go, oh, well, that explains a lot, <laughs> right? Oh, they're from, so, oh, okay, it all comes into focus. Genealogies do this for us, but in the Bible, genealogies have a purpose, and they're not all the same. So different genealogies serve different purposes. And some of the work we want to do in reading genealogies is ask ourselves, why is there a genealogy here? Why is, what is the narrator trying to accomplish? All right? So in the primeval history, why do we have genealogies? Well, one answer would be that it's showing us that the characters in the Bible are following the command to be fruitful and multiply. Remember Genesis 1? God says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So every time you see a genealogy, you're like, okay, they got that. This is happening, right? They're being fruitful. They're multiplying. We laugh, but it matters because remember, Adam and Eve have been cut off from the tree of the, um, life. So no one lives forever. The only way to extend your existence in this world is through procreation. Back then you couldn't leave a great work of art to carry on your name forever. Um, so this mattered greatly. Um, it allows us to follow the universal family tree. Before we get to the Tower of Babel, this is one big family, all right? And then it directs our attention to this one line or one branch of the family as we prepare to begin the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. So remember the first 11 chapters, primeval history, history of the world that is timeless in scope. And then in Genesis 12, 1, we begin the story of Abraham and God's people. So that part of the genealogies are going to get us ready for that Abraham story. But at the bottom here, I listed a couple of references. Genesis 4.1, Genesis 4.17, Genesis 5.1, Genesis 10.1, and Genesis 11.10. Each one of these is either a very brief or a longer genealogy. And what we see in the primeval history is that the genealogies actually are links in between these narrative units. So we move from the story of Adam and Eve to the story of Cain and Abel with 
and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a son, right? And then we move from the Cain and Abel with the genealogy of Cain. So that it's a way to move us from one block or one unit to the next. So another purpose then for these genealogies is to kind of serve as a narrative link or to move the narrative along. Questions about anything I've said so far? We're good? Okay. So now I want to just do a really brief overview of the outline of the primeval history so that we can then focus in on these two genealogies. So first, in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4, we have the first account of creation, the one in the beginning, there's evening and morning, what God made was good, God said be fruitful and multiply. Genesis chapter 2 is the creation story with God making the man and putting him in the garden with the trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life, and then Adam comes and then Eve. And that's also the story where things kind of go south with, you know, the serpent and everything. Um, and then in chapter 4, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And then we have a genealogy that takes us up to the story of the flood. Okay? And then we have this extended narrative which tells us about the flood, Noah, and his wife, and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, um, and bringing all of the creatures into the ark, nothing much resembling that movie we saw a few years ago. <laughs> okay. After the flood, and after they come out of the ark, we have Noah's genealogy. And some scholars would say that we have Noah's genealogy in chapter 9, 18 to 10, 32, and 11, 10 to 29, and that that genealogy is interrupted by the story of the Tower of Babel. All right? Um, so there's some debate about that, but we have Noah's genealogy, and then after the Tower of Babel, the narrative picks up with Shem, focusing specifically on Shem. So let's take a look then at what we have in that section. Now, you read chapters 10 and 11? You read 9 too? 9? So how much did Pastor talk about Ham, which he wasn't supposed to, but how much did he talk about Ham? <laughs> a lot? Mm -hmm. Well, now you're going to get my version. Okay. So... Noah's genealogy happens in the world after the flood. And because it follows all three sons, it's what we call a segmented genealogy. All right? So I have Noah. So think about this. Um, if you go, let's fast forward a little bit. Um, Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And the storyline, you know, it spends a little time with Ishmael, but then it really follows Isaac. And then Isaac has Esau and Jacob. We deal a little bit with Esau, but we're going to follow through Jacob. So if I had paid um, equal attention to all, th all of those children, that would be what we call a segmented genealogy. Okay? So I've got the line of Shem, I have the line of Ham, and I have the line of Japheth. But the genealogy comes after the narrative curse of Ham in chapter 9, verses 18 to 29. And that's what we want to take a look at really briefly. So 918, I want you to just pay attention to first to verse 18, 918. And I'm going to read it, and I want you to tell me what's peculiar about it. The sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. What is peculiar about that? Say, what? Right. Why does it have to say Ham was the father of Canaan? So the fact, remember the Bible is a very, especially biblical Hebrew, is very economical. It's not, it doesn't have to, it's only going to tell you what it needs you to know. So if it's telling me that Ham was the father of Canaan, that matters in this story. 
So when we hear Canaan, what comes to mind? The Canaanites. Who are the Canaanites? The people who were in the land that the Israelites were supposed to get. What else do we know about the Canaanites? They, they were giants. They were big. What else? Do we like the Canaanites? Why don't we like the Canaanites? Other than they were in the land that we believed was ours, and they were bigger than we were. What else did the Canaanites do? They worshipped other gods. All right? So they represented different religious traditions. And the term Canaanite is an umbrella term for a lot of different groups of people or subgroups of people. But if I start off the story by saying Ham was the father of Canaan, before you read another word, what do you know about Ham? He's not going to have a positive story. <laughs> All right? It's not going to happen. And one of the things we have to realize is that the Israelites are telling their story and they want you to feel some kind of way about Ham. All right? So let's be clear. This doesn't mean that Shem and Japheth are above reproach. We're not interested in them. We're interested in making you understand why we don't like Ham. And this will make it so much easier to take the land. Think about it. If I'm coming from a perspective where I believe they are wrongly inhabiting my land, I don't want them to be good people, so they've got to be bad. And it's always good if you can trace someone's badness all the way back to the very beginning. And Israel is very, very good at this. All right? So the question we want to ask ourselves is, what is the political landscape of the people who are telling the story, okay? We should never presume that the Bible is not political, all right? Um, it's just hard not to be, particularly when you are a, an oppressed people. Um, everything is political. Okay, so I'm just gonna go off script for a little bit because there was this really great example that I saw on television. So stay with me if you don't watch this show. But there's a show on NBC called This Is Us. Yes. Okay, some of you watch the show. So there's a woman, one of the main characters, who um, has struggled with her weight her entire life. Uh, her entire life. And she's trying to sing, and she auditions, and she goes to the audition, and then she chickens out because she looks around all these little skinny things, and she gets, you know, she gets freaked out. She leaves. She comes back. She's like, I'm going to do this. She auditions, and she starts singing 15 seconds into the song. The guy says, thank you very much. She starts to walk off the stage, and she stops, and she goes back, and she makes her, you know, I am woman, hear me roar speech, and says, you're not going to dismiss me because, I'm, because of the way I look, and blah, 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 blah. And he shows her that that's not why he dismissed her. But if in your mind you have always been oppressed, you will always think that the thing that happens to you is because of your oppression. It is hard not to be paranoid. It is hard for Israel not to be paranoid. They have always been a little nation. They've never had weapons like everybody else. So this is why they're always singing about everybody else with horses and chariots because they've never had them. And when they get them, they don't know how to act, right? <laughs> so when you read Israel talking about other nations, don't forget this is an underdog who is finally getting the chance to have a little comeuppance, all right? So it may have an impact on how we understand what Israel was trying to do. And then think about what you've been working with with Pastor Wesley about how later traditions take this material and use it differently. Okay? So here we have a nation that's feeling like an underdog who's got to say something about all these other people that's not positive. And then in the tradition, how that gets used to justify the atrocities of slavery and all kinds of oppression. Okay? So let's think about the nations. So Canaanites, Ishmaelites, Moabites, Ammonites, Philistines, Edomites, and Arameans. I put an, an asterisk behind Ishmaelites, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, and Arameans, because all of those people are either descendants of Abram or Terah. 
all right? So when I say that we talk about race and ethnicity as a construct, what I need you to understand is that the Ishmaelites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, and the Arameans were related by blood to the Israelites. And the fact that they go from being family to nations is an intentional set of steps that is taken. And if you look at the origin stories, you can see how this is already starting. So the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau? And Esau was a big, burly guy who wasn't very bright, who sold away his birthright for some soup, right? It must, I'm, I'm sure it was good, right? <laughs> but it depicts him in a very negative light. And Jacob is able to outsmart him and outtrick him, all right? The Edomites became the enemies of the Israelites when the, well, they became the enemies of the Israelites, but there is a moment in history, and we hear about it in Psalm 137. When the Babylonians are destroying Israel, the Edomites are standing on the side cheering, tear it down, tear it down, tear it down. Well, when, you, when I tell my story, guess how you're going to look? Okay? That's the Edomites. The Moabites and the Ammonites the grandsons and sons of Lot. Genesis 19, all right? Terrible, incestuous origins, all right? So the Israelites are able to justify pushing the Moabites and the Ammonites out. The Ishmaelites, descendants of Ishmael. Remember the prophecy that Hagar gets in the wilderness? He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. All right? These people are related to the Israelites. But in Israel's stories, we see a process of what I call othering. Right? This is how your family members become your enemies. Because you tell a narrative or spin a story. Think about how we use language. Thugs. All right? We use language to other people, all right? So some people get to be terrorists and some people get to be lone wolves, right? Think about language, right? So it is so powerful that we can use language to make connections to people or to make divisions, all right? And what we observe is in Israel's own development as a nation, Israel makes decisions at times to make people other as opposed to family. Now, the beauty of Scripture is that sometimes God didn't read the rule book, and God will use some of these people as God's instruments, which then forces Israel's hand. Well, now what are we going to do? Right? God decides to show up over there. So now we have to figure out what we're going to do. But pay attention, because what Israel does, it seems to me, is um, not unique amongst oppressed people. That oppressed people are exceptionally good at othering others. Right? So that we who have been oppressed are very good at drawing lines that shut other people out. Right? Right? Some of us, as soon as we get in, we want to shut the door, right? I'm in, all right, that we're good. So, it's, I, so part of what we want to learn from Scripture, see, this is why it's important to think about we're not just supposed to memorize who begat, but we're supposed to observe how even God's people fall prey to this concept that there should be insiders and outsiders, and I want to be on the inside. All right? And how quickly we forget that until God saved us, we were outsiders. Okay? All right. Let's see where we're going next. The Arameans would have been Terah's descendants. So in Psalm, uh, dude, I can tell you where. In 
Give me a second because I have a little note here from something else. Okay, in Deuteronomy 26, one of the things that the Israelites would have said when they did their first fruit ceremony, Deuteronomy 26, um, it's explaining when you give your sacrifice of first fruits, what you would say in verse 5, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor. So there they're referring to Terah's people. So the problem with Terah's people, or Abraham's father, and the, the, the people before Abram was that they worshipped other gods. Okay? Sure. So when we read these stories, these origin stories, one of the questions we want to ask is, how does Israel depict her neighbors to reflect political reality. All right? So you want to ask yourself, when Israel's talking about Esau, and we know Esau is not just an individual, but he represents the Edomites, what is the political reality that allows me to tell the story this way? Are you all with me? Okay? And then who are these people in reality? Are they really our enemies, or are they people that we have decided we need to be separate from? All right? And so then my question is, in this process of othering, is it race, ethnicity, politics, or all of the above? All right? So this goes back to this concept for me of construct, that to what extent do we describe people as other to promote a certain identity? Okay? And what is the identity that we want to promote? One of the things that we do, for example, um, I, I always say this as a joke, and, I, and it, sh it shouldn't be a joke, but I say sometimes when we tell our family story, we don't mention the uncle that's in jail. <laughs> right? Because somehow we think that that doesn't present us in the best light, but that is a part of who we are. All right? And it's hurt, it hurts us in a couple of ways. It's like we're cutting ourselves off from ourselves. It doesn't just hurt the person we don't remember. It hurts us because we're not then presenting our true selves. All right? And this is a temptation, if you think about it, um, in American culture, because we want to be winners all the time, which then is inviting us to tell half-truths. All right. So what might the agenda be that Israel is trying to promote? Who does Israel consider herself to be? The chosen people. And so, if I'm the chosen people, then there must be some reason why these other people are not chosen. And what tends to happen is that Israel then assumes that there is a merit system involved. Right? So the people who aren't God's people, well, they, there's a reason. And maybe that undercuts the very concept of grace, right? That Israel wasn't chosen because, and God tells Israel this, somehow they don't get it. I didn't choose you because you were bigger or stronger or better. I chose you because you were the runt of the litter, right? To show myself strong. And so that then the idea would be then that you would continue to do that work. All right, so let's look at the passage. Um, Genesis 10, 1 to 32. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I forgot. Let me, um, I, I know. Um, before we do that, um, so in 9, I said, Ham was the father of Canaan. Um, so these are the three sons of Noah. From these, the whole earth was peopled. So what is it that Ham does in chapter 9? Gets this whole thing off to a bad start. And what does that mean? So what does it mean to see your father naked? Hmm? Yes. It's a shameful thing. Um, but the, the term could mean several things. It probably does not mean that he saw his father naked. It is a violation of some kind of boundary. Okay? So think about in the Bible, uncovering someone's nakedness usually has some kind of sexual overtone. So there's some possibilities. Did he sleep with his mother? Did he see his parents engaged in some kind of intimate activity? There are all these possibilities. The point is a boundary was breached, 
But I want you to get this and pay attention because Israel often will make someone appear to be less than, um, less than worthy by connecting them with some kind of sexual impropriety. Hmm, interesting. Um, the way in which um, Ammon and Moab, you know, incest, um, that there is even here in this ancient world um, this heightened um, sensitivity around sexuality that makes sexual impropriety um, cause people to back up. Are you all with me? So if he does something that really violates the child-parent relationship and boundary, maybe then it's easier for us to accept that Cain is going to serve, well, Canaan is going to serve his brothers. Look at the curse in 25. It says, cursed be Canaan. It doesn't say cursed be Ham right? So you can see already we've moved from Noah's three sons to this larger political reality. All right? So now, all right, I just want to make sure we got that. Okay, so now to chapter 10. So I'm going to, if you look at the first 32 verses, my question is, who gets the most airtime in the genealogy? And who or what is important to the narrator? So here we go. These are the descendants of Noah's son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Children were born to them after the flood. The descendants of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The descendants of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Repheth, and Togarma. The descendants of Jaba, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Rodanim. From these, the coastland people spread. These are the descendants of Japheth in their lands, with their, langu with their own language, by their families, in their nations. And you see here it's got their own land and their own language, all right? Families in their nations. So we've got one, two, five verses for, or four, four verses, we start at two, two, three, four, five for Japheth. All right, verse six, the descendants of Ham, Cush. What's Cush? Ethiopia, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. So the descendants are nations. Do you see that? Okay. Um, the descendants of Cush, Seba, Havilah, another land, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteka. The descendants of Rama, Sheba, and Dadan. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He was the first one on earth to become a mighty warrior. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, and Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. Hold on to that Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth ear, Kala, reason between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Egypt became the father of Ludim, Anan, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, Kasluhim, and Kaftorim, from which finally the Philistines come. Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn in Heth. And the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, the Hamathites. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites spread abroad, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar, as far as Gaza in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Admon, Zeboiim, as far as Lasha. These are the descendants of Ham by their families, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Do you recognize any names in there? Yeah, we got all right, a lot of people up in there. None of these are good, but we recognize a lot of these names, okay? So the people who will be in the land of Canaan, the Egyptians who are going to enslave us, Sodom and Gomorrah, that doesn't go so well. Um, Nineveh, all right? All of these name places. So remember, would these places have even existed at the moment that we're getting this narrative? So we've got this kind of collapse of time where you've got someone looking back on this story, making the connection between where it was and where we are. All right, 21, to Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born, the descendants of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram, the descendants of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash, 
Arpachshad became the father of Shela. Shela became the father of Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almodad. Shelaf, Hazarmaveth, Jera, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havila, and Jobab. These, all these were the descendants of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Misha in the direction of Sifar, the hill country of the east. These are the descendants of Shem by their families, their languages, their lands, and nations. These are the families of Noah's sons according to their genealogies and their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So who gets the most airtime? What's important to the narrator? Hmm. Ham and? and Shem. Apparently Japheth is, you know, we're not as interested in Japheth's line. Many people think that Japheth is the ancestor of the group that we would call the Philistines because the Philistines are often referred to as sea people. Um, and there's one, yeah, it says from these the coastland people spread in verse 5. So some people think that this might have been referring to the Philistines. But here you see Shem, so um, Shem, and then think um, Semite. Um, so we have um, that line, which is going to be the line from which Abraham comes, and then the people who become the enemies of Abram. And that, that political reality, that religious reality, um, that social reality, has an impact on the way we tell the story and the way we lay out the genealogy. Okay? What comes next is the Tower of Babel. So before we get to the rest of the genealogy, we get this little story about the Tower of Babel in chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar. Go back to um, Cain, um, Ham. I got the wrong bad person. Ham. Um, verse 10. All right, there we go. All of them from the land of Shinar. All right. They came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down. Oh, let's just stop right there for a second. So why did they build the tower? So they, why? So they won't be scattered. Why would they think they were going to be scattered? Like, where does that even come from? Huh? It's, think about it. There's something ironic about the story because they said, let's do this and we won't be scattered. And what happened? They got scattered. They got scattered. So it's a little counterproductive, right? They're like, if we do this, but it's, so the question we want to ask is always like, well, what made them think they were going to be scattered in the first place? That's never happened before, all right? So they're going to build this city and a tower with its top to the heavens. And what is the significance of that? Why do I want to build a city with its top to the heavens? Be, say it again. Be, exactly, be closer to God. So in the ancient world and in the modern world, we always think of God as up here right? And we're down here. And so that's why mountains matter. That's why high places matter, because you could get closer to God. And this says, let us build a city with the tower with its top to the heavens. Except that little preposition there, um, the letter bait, it could mean to the heavens, in the heavens, or against the heavens. So are they trying to just get to God and have communion, or are they trying to take over? All right? It's not clear what, they're, that, what they want to do. All right? So then the Lord says, the Lord came down to see the city. So you, this reinforces this idea of God up, because God has to come down. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. 
Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Yes, come to the mic. I feel, it's, I feel like it needs a mic. So why do you feel, when you said, okay, wasn't sure whether they were building the tower to kind of replace God or be, take on the power of God, why do you feel that's uncertain when the reason God created the language barrier was, I thought, because in order, because they were trying to come against his power and so he right. kind of, you know, separated them. And, yeah. So it could be that they were trying to go against God's power or simply that they were trying to be somewhere they weren't supposed to be. It could just simply be a transgression of barriers. Um, so it may be that they had every good intention about getting to heaven and God was like, but that's not where you're supposed to be. So you could read it one way or the other. But what's interesting in this story is what God says. They have one language and they are one. And this way they are unstoppable. And I always feel like that is a, a secret message to us, that we are limited by our inability to be one. That if we could be one and speak one language, there is nothing we could not do. So if I say that the primeval history is not just about how things came to be, but how things are, part of what this is saying to us is we have, and we can't quite get it together and speak the same language. That there's a limitation in us that keeps us from being unified. Now that's not to mean that we shouldn't work against that, but that that, that might speak to something about the nature of humans. Okay? Um, let me say a couple more things about this. Sometimes we read the story of Babel as a punishment, but I do think we could simply read it as what it means to be human. What it means to be human is that you will gravitate towards people who speak like you, or who think like you, or who see the world the way you do, or who speak your language. That we tend to form communities around what we have in common, and that that ultimately, although that may be comfortable, also limits us, all right? There's something to be gained from forging relationships with people who speak different languages, who see things differently. And so I feel like part of what this text is doing is kind of speaking to um, the sadness in the limitations of the human condition, okay? What's interesting is that in church traditions that use lectionaries, they always have this passage on Pentecost. So the first reading is about the division of languages, and then they read the story about Pentecost. But in Pentecost, God does not make everybody speak the same language. In Pentecost, God gives us the ability to speak other languages. So it seems to me that the, that the response is not for everyone to speak the same language, but for us to become multilingual. Okay? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so let me try to answer that in two parts. First part, I think the thing that messes Ham up is he goes and tells his brothers. So it was like, it was, I think that was maybe what, you know, that was the, that's what sealed it. Because it could, for up until that point, it could have been accidental, right? Now, the thing with the Tower of Babel, I think that the people moving from one language to multiple languages is the same thing for, and this is just me talking, as 
Adam and Eve taking the fruit, that both of those stories are talking about something that was inevitable. That part, that, um, so the, the way I see it is Adam and Eve, God puts Adam and Eve in the garden, says, don't touch this fruit. It's only a matter of time. Somebody's going to do it, right? Two people, one person, 17 people, it doesn't matter who they are, what the makeup is, what their gender is, if you are a human being with free will, somebody up in there one day is going to do it, right? So for me, it's not a story about the fall. It's a story about what it means to be human. What it means to be human is we are going to disobey God, right? Similarly, it seems to me Babel is about what it means to be human. What it means to be human is even though we have the capacity to be multilingual, we will tend, we have a proclivity to form communities with people who see things the way we do. That, that's why I keep saying that the primeval history is not simply about what happened, but about how things are. It's trying to tell us something about human nature. Um, okay, and I, so uh, let me finish this up. So Tower of Babel, and then we go to Um, so yes, yeah, so the last question here for the Tower of Babel. So if we read this as an event, does the event in Babel change our origins? Even though now we have these uh, segmented genealogy, and even though we speak different languages, and we gravitate towards different areas and different lands, it doesn't change the fact that we have common ancestry. So. At the end, even in the midst of all this separation and segmentation, we still, according to this narrative, all go back to Adam. Okay? So that never changes. And it seems to me part of what happens is that that's the piece we have to remind ourselves in our history. So how far back do you go in the story? So when you talk about the construct of identity, where does your story begin and where does it end? If it, begins with Ad, if it begins with Adam, then your family, by definition, is going to be much larger. All right? So when we start talking, and this matters to me greatly in our nation today, because we are having all these discussions about statues and this and that, where do we begin the narrative? What is the starting point? Because where you start is going to have a lot to do with where you end up. All right? And I think we are intentional about where we begin our narratives. And that that in and of itself, so I, um, I, I just can't stress this enough, but the telling of history is a political act. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so now, the second genealogy on the other side of Babel, I think one of the reasons the Tower of Babel comes in between is because it's trying to signify that we're moving from a universal story, from the story of humanity to the story of one family. So now we're going to focus in on Shem. He's our guy, okay? These are the descendants of Shem in 1110. When Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arpachshad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after the birth of Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And Arpachshad lived after the birth of Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And Shelah lived after the birth of Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. You get the pattern here. Eber, 34 years, had Peleg. He lived 430 years. Peleg lived 30 years, became the father of Reu. He lived 209 years. He was on the short side. Reu, 32 years, became the father of Serug. Reu lived 207 years. It's coming down, it seems, right? Serug lived 30 years, became the father of Nahor. Serug lived 200 years. Nahor lived 29 years, became the father of Terah. Um, Nahor lived 119 years. Terah lived 70 years. Ha yeah, yeah, see that? Became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So the other ones had other sons and daughters, other sons and daughters. Now I get Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So we know now we're focusing in on this family. These are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives, and Abram Abram's wife is Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. 
See, now you begin to understand how barrenness fits into a culture where it's all about who's next, who's next, who's next. And if someone has a wife and there are no children, um, more often than not, in this culture, it gets placed on the wife. Now, it's interesting and it's of note because in Ugaritic cultures, we, it tends to be, so in other ancient Near, Near Eastern cultures, it can be the husband's fault. So just so you know, it's equal opportunity blame. Um, but what happens in scripture is very different because scripture then treats this theologically and says, God closed someone's womb. So in scripture, God opens and closes wombs. Okay, 31, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife. They went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. This is um, an important um, note because we start in chapter 12 with the genealogy of the story of Abraham where God tells Abram to leave and to go to the land that I will show you. But if you look at this genealogy, what we learn is that Abram is doing something that his father started. All right? Herod, so that his father left to go to Canaan, came to Haran, the crossroads, and stayed there and died there. Okay? So the last thing I want to point out is that we have now examined the way in which we have moved from a universal family to one family, and how, if we look back over time, this one family has systematically othered parts of its own family to perhaps justify their chosenness. But if you look at the call that God gave to Abraham in chapter 12, there's what we call a threefold promise, where God promises, let me just read it so you don't think I'm making it up and we're almost done. Genesis 12, God says, um, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Threefold promise, land, descendants, and blessing. But it clearly says, through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Was Abram chosen as the father of the Israelites so that all the nations of the world, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Canaanites, all of them could be blessed. And is that the purpose of being called in the first place? So that we can bless others and share God's grace. All right, we're going to stop there. All right, unless I think I've got three minutes for questions. Do we have questions? You're not gonna like this one because this has been burning on me forever and ever and ever. Okay. But we're talking genealogy. Mm -hmm. Abraham is the blessing of the world. Mm -hmm. Through him, you know, we're setting it up for Jesus to be born through David and the whole thing. So Joseph is lent line to David, but Mary isn't. And Mary is the mother of Jesus. Dave and Joseph is not. They never did a genealogy on Mary. So how do you? How is and where is the genealogy that proves Christ is the descendant of David? Okay, seminarians, I've got a Matthew and a Luke genealogy. Isn't one of those Marys? I've never been able to find out. Yes, genealogy which one is Mary. it? So, oh, please. <laughs> please, which one is please. it? Please, please. Go to the mic. Oh, right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <She's so laughs> Come on. It's amazing how God works. Yes. But, oh, let me just tell you. I'm, I moved from Florida like a month ago, so I'm new to the area, and I really love your church. Amen. So let me say that. Thank God. Um, I was listening to a radio station, and this little old man, like, he, he, I think he's dead, actually. It was an old station, well, an old program, and he clearly gave the answer. <laughs> of the sons of, J of Jacob, Nathan was the son of who Mary came through. Where is that? Judah. It's, it's, it's there. Okay. Judah is the son who Joseph came through. Okay. I'd love to find the text to tell you, but clearly, 
Nathan is the son of, is, one, is, is um, Solomon's son. Yeah. And um, Judah was the other one who, um, Joseph came through Judah, and Nathan, Mary came through Nathan. No, 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 no. David came through Judah. David comes through the line correct, of Judah, correct. and that's yes. the line. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mary came through the other so, side, Nathan. So, okay. we'll, we'll confirm next week. Come on, let's get out of here and pray. I'm, I think that one of those genealogies is Mary's. That's what, Matthew is Mary. No, yeah, no. Mm -mm, no, 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 no. That's not what I need. Mary and Rahab and um, all the bad girls. Yeah, no, no, it's not. No, that's Joseph. All right, don't. All right, let's pray. Yeah, but that is actually Joseph's genealogy. That one is Matthew is. Jo yeah, it says Joseph, husband of Mary. So Mary is named in it, but the, well, I'll tell you later. Let's pray. God, you are so good. And we thank you that we get a chance to study and to wrestle and to seek your word. Help us, Lord, to learn. Help us to be open to hearing your voice so that we can be better servants. And Lord, I ask that if there's anything I said that is not of you, that it would blow away like the chaff. Only that which is of you will remain. Now I ask that you would be with all those who are suffering in this world today yes. and ask that you would get everyone here home safely and return Thank them you. to their families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.